Good evening. Welcome to the Spiritual But Not Religious show. I'm your host, George Lewis. I've got uh, great guests for this evening and uh, some really good guests coming up uh, in the in the near future here next week and in the month of July. Let me tell you a little bit about the Spiritual But Not Religious show. Uh, it really developed out of the idea that there there just isn't any uh, community for people who are spiritual but not religious. Uh, those of us that uh, still have a belief in some kind of a higher power or a god or you know some something outside of the mainstream religions and no real gathering place. So and I began to realize there's a, a, a lot of us, millions of us that uh, that are out there who many claim to be Christians but don't see it in the in the uh, uh, fundamentalist kind of Christian view. And uh, the Spiritual Broadcasting Network uh, was developed in order to bring a vo your voice, the voices of that community, of that spiritual community that's out there uh, that really hasn't got a place for a voice at this point. Uh, so we'll be bringing you um, authors and just people who are active in in the in the spiritual world and new ideas new focus uh, I, I've got next week's guest is uh, Hank Wesselman he authors he's actually the author of several books uh, we're going to be talking about this book awakening to the spirit world it's the shamanic path of direct in direct revelation which is probably our best source of information but somehow or other we've gotten turned away from any kind of direct revelation i, I think you'll enjoy it uh tom and i he sent us a couple of books and tom and i've both been reading it. it's a it's an excellent book my guest for tonight is uh karen mason miller and karen has written her second book and it's called hand wash cold it's care instructions for an ordinary life. And I'll tell you what, I, I, it's a captivating book and um, it's really profound kind of, inform, inform, not just information, profound kind of uh, things that you can bring into your life to enrich your life and, and bring you more into, into your life and in tune with your life. Uh, she's an excellent writer and I'm sure that you'll enjoy her. Do we have, uh, we have Karen on the line? Yes, we do, George. Hi, Karen. Hi. Uh, how are you this evening? I've been looking forward to talking to you. I want I want I want you to know a couple things before we get started here. One, I'm I'm totally impressed by your writing skills. You're an excellent writer, and your, your use of metaphor and and your uh, and your your Zen kind of a way really shows through in your writing. I totally appreciate it. It's, it's just a great read. Thank you. So. I, you know, you, you, I want to just, I, 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 usually I, I ask uh, for a bio, uh, a short bio, but, but the truth is your book really uh, gives us a lot about that. And I, I want to spend some time with your book. Uh, and I'm, I'm uh, first, before we get there, though, let, what's, a, what's the website for people to go to that want to buy your book? Um, I uh, offer it on my own website. Right. And of course, it's available in all stores and, and online stores like Amazon and such. But my website is KarenMasonMiller.com, and Mason is spelled M-A-E-Z-E-N, KarenMasonMiller.com. Tom was telling me that, uh, you know, like the story of, of, of why you use uh, your middle name, Mason. Oh, yeah. Maybe, uh -huh. maybe, maybe you can share that with our, with sure, our viewers. Sure. Mason is my Dharma name. It's my Buddhist name. Uh-huh. And uh, in the tradition in which I practice, which is the Japanese tradition, uh, it's a living lineage carried from teacher to student with a transmission that occurs uh, occasionally, you know, perhaps uh, very rarely, but nonetheless a living transmission of wisdom and the teaching. Uh, when a student uh, publicly formalizes their commitment to the training or the practice of Buddhism, even as a lay practitioner, they're given a name. Uh -huh. And it's a ceremony in which you take precepts. You, know, you essentially make vows. And like most vows that you take, you know, they have a meaning well beyond the words that you might utter, you know, and an impact that may be more profound than you realize at the time. Uh, absolutely. <laughs> but you're actually given a name. 
And uh, because my line is a Japanese line, my, my name is a, uh, a set of Japanese syllables put together. And at first, when you're given another name, we're so vested. That's really what this practice is, George. You know, we're so vested in this concept of self and our own self-identity. Oh, yeah. It's just a set of ideas and beliefs that we hold about ourselves, you know. So it's very difficult at the beginning to imagine that you would ever be known by any other name than the one that you're accustomed to being called. So it's quite an awkward point. Um, you might <coughs> never remember this name, I won't know how to spell it or say it, and no one will ever remember it. But like all things over time, you simply begin to wear it into a state of familiarity, and it right. becomes your nature. And so, Mazen is my Dharma name, and before, actually, when I, you know, I, although I spent a lifetime, or half of a lifetime, in uh, the working world as a writer... And as a publicist, writing words for other people to say and attributed to other people, I never felt like I had anything at all honest or true that I could share. But when I began to write in my own name, it struck me as uh, being appropriate that I use my full Dharma name since everything I write comes from my practice. It comes from the teaching. And so I'm really become quite... I fully embodied my name. <laughs> well, you, actually, I think the, the, the whole idea of a name from the very beginning was that it was supposed to somehow or other speak to our very nature. Well, yes, and it, you know, and it does. It's something... Um, but, but what really... How we arrive at our nature is that we let go of all the false concepts that we hold that's already. a job that's a huge job right there sure yeah so in a way it is something that you practice with like everything that you practice with everything in your life the same thing is true of course if you should marry and change your last name i mean that change is some would think that it's really quite anachronistic now and you probably know that the first time I married, I did not change my last name. Absolutely, I do know that, yes. Yeah, and, and actually I found that that was the perfect representation of my state of involvement in that relationship. I oh, that makes sense. I was not involved in that relationship. <laughs> right, I'm not really immersed here. Huh? Yeah. Yeah. So there are lots of ways, whether you're in a formal, you know, uh, you know, Zen path or not, that we come up time and time again with this business of who we think we are. And, uh, you know, and all of the definitions and labels and names that we ascribe to who we think we are. I, I've just, you know, I, I relate to your, your book so much, although I have a different path it, it's very very similar to what your path is and and the, the you know the the biggest challenge for me has been around these old beliefs and these old ideas and ferreting them out and and, and even more difficult is the ones that i really cherish you know like is to, to put them up for grabs and to see if you know why i even believe them uh, you know, those ones that say, no matter what, you know. I, yes, 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 and those are, actually, we call them attachments. Right. You know? But uh, that's also very frequently misunderstood. Um, you know, the, the truth is that we live in a world in which we perceive things to be fixed and solid and um, everlasting. And uh, whether that's an idea or a belief we hold or whether it's anything at all, you know, um, and yet nothing is fixed and solid. And uh, that's why we call it a practice, just you know, consistently, moment by moment, and day by day, and month by month, and year by year, you know, we peel back these layers to see, oh my goodness, you know, this one's a really tough one. It's easy, in a way, to let go of the superficialities. Absolutely, you know, yeah. To make superficial changes in how we think and how we act, and the life around us, um, you know, and, and that's, of course, where practice begins. We make what appear to be really colossal shifts, but they're just changes in appearance. Right, <laughs> right. And those are the easy ones. <laughs> well, you know, it seems like the ones that really have any real depth or impact in my life are the ones I don't want to look at about myself. I don't even want to admit that I of am course. these things, you know. Yeah, it's really painful. Yeah. Yeah, and you know what, but... <coughs> But what's interesting is that you pass through that and, and the pain disappears. 
you know, that pain is... Uh, it's illusion, it's, an illusion. Yeah. 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 But nonetheless, you know, you, we, you know, that's what we're called to do. That to be complete, so that we can be completely free. Um, you know, and, and to... to C- completely free and yet still know all the joy uh, of living. So joy. Oh, absolutely, without mm-hmm. any limitation. Yeah. Without any limitation. Stuck to nothing. You right. Know, sticking to nothing. And that means, you know, we can, uh, you know, weep when it's time to weep, cry when it's time to cry, laugh. It's the effortlessness. You know, uh, nothing is withheld from us. And that's the elimination of suffering, too. Absolutely. We have pain, but we don't have to have suffering. That's kind that's of... That's right, because that, that's that misery that, you know, some people think, well, the whole notion that anything's chronic. Right. Nothing in life is chronic, you know. Uh, some things yeah. we'd like to make chronic, like our bank account being full. By, by, by our habits of mind, right. you know, that we want to believe that things um, are forever, you know, whether it's... <coughs> Forever, or or the hardship that lasts forever. Nothing lasts forever. Well, you know, you 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 started out your book with uh, a, a very powerful statement. Uh, you know, and I think you know when you talk with most people, the, the two things that are primary in their mind is uh, finances and romances. Uh, <laughs> I mean, there's a lot of other things, but most of it falls under those two categories. Well, that's desire, yeah. Yeah. Uh-huh. Well, and, you know, and I, I think we must have desire. The whole world, the whole universe itself runs on desire, I guess. Absolutely. Yeah, that's our cells desire. are desirous to be in the form that we're in, or we wouldn't be where we're at. Absolutely. But it's about learning how to deal with that differently, isn't it? Well, sure. It's not the desire that's a problem. It's the attachment. Yes. The yeah, the fact that things change. Well, you know, you, you you made you make this this statement about relationships, and you say deep transformational love is born out of what you don't much like at all. <laughs> and and I and I and you're absolutely I I couldn't agree more. But but that's a that's a pretty uh, that's a difficult pill to swallow when you're in the romance part of the relationship. Well, you don't have to swallow it when you're in the romance part. No, I don't I think mean, you, know, I don't think you can. in the romance part, frankly, you know, you're blind. Yeah, oh, absolutely. And, you know, it's a wonderful, wonderful circumstance. I mean, it's kind of like a, a, a three a, 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 a three dip ice cream cone. <laughs> you know, it's like, my gosh, it's huge and you think it's going to last forever. <laughs> and you enjoy it, you know, and it, 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 it you know what I mean? So, and and I don't need to explore. I don't think we need to explore. Really, there's there's a profound um, purpose for that. I think uh, that is um, that comes out of the nature of life. You know, and that is that life wants to sustain life. Absolutely. And that life wants to expand and be enhanced and and endure. And so I think that's the nature of what that is. But. Um, I think more so than that, uh, you know, everything in our life is an opportunity to wake up. Everything in our life is an opportunity to see clearly. And so when we see clearly, we have to see through our blind spots. It's easy to love someone who does what we like, someone who validates our own choices, who mirrors our own beliefs, our preferences, you know. And, and in a way, that's really what we go out, we go out seeking. Let yes, we do the right person for me which really is like me <laughs> and the truth is i'm not sure that's what we really want no we don't no. but we tell ourselves we want that because right. of course what happens is that no matter what we think we're doing we end up in a situation in which it's not at all what we expected you know i don't think any relationship is ever what we expect and that just not is not a relationship but i mean a circumstance where the job turned out to be not the job we had in mind you know the, the city, the town we live in, you know, whatever experience we had, it wasn't quite what we expe- we were expecting. And that's really what I'm speaking to, that when we can see that, my goodness, when we view life as a set of opposites, well, there's this over here that I like, and there's that over there that I don't like, which is nothing other than our relationship with our own point of view. Yes. Something's right, something's wrong, something's good, something's bad. And, you know, that's an endless <coughs> Excuse me. And you're in a relationship with your own ego and your own ego mind. 
and it's doomed. <laughs> Absolutely, because the ego mind will just take you on a journey that's never ending and ends up suffering. That's just that's right, and that comes out of ignorance. It's what yeah. we call in in the Buddhist tradition we call samsara, the world right. of ignorance, which comes out of the mistaken belief that we live in opposition to our life and everything in our life. You know that we are a an intact, inviolable, fixed entity called Karen or Mason or me or I, and that everything that I experience in my life is outside of me. Right. Yeah. Or and even the, uh, or it, it's just the, the same delusion to think that certain things are inside of me. <laughs> the truth is that everything that I experience is me, <laughs> I, you, and only my experience. And and uh, you know and, and I think that the key to this and this is a, a big part of what you're what I, I picked up from your book is to take these ideas this awakening and you know awaken to these ideas but to be able to take them out of any esoteric realm and bring them down and put them to work in your everyday life right where they it's, yeah, they're, yeah. They, they are they're dead in the esoteric realm absolutely you know, and, and it, I I'll point out that Zen Buddhism is is unique among different forms of Buddhism because um, it doesn't have an esoteric aspect. Well, it has a mystical aspect, though. Of course, it's entirely mystical. Yeah, it's an absolutely it, mystical. It is, mm -hmm. it, is the, it, is, it is the mystical experience. Yes. That is um, available to each practitioner through zazen, or through, through <sighs> practicing what Buddha did, which was seated meditation, you know, so. Right. But it is absent any doctrine or dogma, um, and and so it, it's unique in that we sim we don't teach or preach what Buddha taught or supposedly taught. We do what Buddha did. Right. And so that's completely practical. It's it's one hundred percent hands on. And the point is to see how the 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 the, the complete difference between what you think and feel about your life, which occurs frankly inside your skull. And yeah, everything happens in there. It's like life happens right between our ears. Yes, or we think it does. Yeah. And, and what it, our life itself, which appears because of the uh, extraordinary property of the brain to, although all visual stimulus, all stimulus is, is processed in the brain, it appears to come from outside of our skin, do you know? Right. So that's what we, what's the whole purpose of the practice is to, wake up to the life that you're actually experiencing instead of your commentary your thoughts and feelings about you that's it in a nutshell well, we, uh, we, we, before we go for, I want to say something to our audience about the fact that you're not seeing uh, Karen in in the video tonight because of uh, she, actually she, I don't think I don't think she has a webcam, and so we weren't able. But but I'm really pleased that we have you on 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 oh, voice, Karen. You, I, 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 I I'm one of the things I'm curious about. I. I I see myself as as a mystic. I that's you know where I finally came down to, and and I don't know that I'm, I'm any particular kind of a mystic. Although uh, I I really relate to Zen, and I also relate to Sufi, to the Sufism, and, uh, uh, and 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 even some of the contemplative stuff as far as Catholicism is concerned. But in Zen and in Buddhism, where does the idea, if at all, of a, of God or a higher power come in for for our listeners, our, our viewers? What it, 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 what is that concept in in yeah. Zen Buddhism? Yeah, well, it's not a concept. That's probably the the first thing. Right. And, and even as I venture into this realm and I describe this to you, you realize we're going into an intellectual realm. Right. So um, all all instead tell you that what the point of our practice is to shed the false self, which is an egotistical, and it's not just egotistic, it's the egocentric self, right. which is me as a, as being separate. Right. And directly experience the true nature that we are, which might be called the original self, might be called Buddha nature, it's the enlightened mind, it is the absolute. 
so it is what some would call God, although even when we use that term, we're going to append it and, and we're kind of going to shape it with our own conceptual notions of whatever we think a God is. Absolutely. You know? And so um, it's a dangerous territory to get into because confusion uh, arises out of that. We experience that through our meditation and in or Zazen, which is said to be the direct experience of your enlightened mind or of the absolute. Now, it's not a fixed state, you know, where right. you might say, well, goodness, if I can do that, surely then all I'm going to do is sit, you know, stone still <laughs> and no longer <coughs> engage with, um, you know, with my regular life. But that's not the point of our practice. We say in in fact, in the, in the fundamental um, sutra or teaching of Buddhism, to encounter the way, is to encounter the absolute is not yet enlightenment. You know, it is what we are. It is the mystery of our very being. And I think that, that word right there really captures that whole idea of, of God or higher power for me, and that is mystery. Yes, yeah. because the truth is, you and I can say, well, gosh, it's just me, or it's just my body, or it's just my breath, or my pancreas, or it's just the earth, but the truth is, we don't, none of us, has the slightest conceptual understanding of life. No. It's like, we it's, have no knowledge of it. We can name parts of it, you know, but this is experiential. You know, the practice is experiential. How do you get out of your head? That's essentially it. And inside that head is your accumulated knowledge, your beliefs, your ideas, your ideals, your philosophies, so-called principles. And the truth is that's just like that's the way we want to approach everything, you know, in our life, to kind of have a conceptual understanding of it. That's the way right. most of us uh, approach uh, religious or spiritual. Life. Which is all about trying to gain control. Yeah, figure it out. Absolutely, because if I can figure it out, some other I can control it, and I don't have to be frightened of it. And I can manipulate the outcome. Absolutely. Yeah, yeah, exactly. That's 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 um, illusion. <laughs> it's a, it's a total illusion, and, and you know what's amazing about it that as many times as we can fall and stumble and scrape our head, we still you know until we reach a point where we finally give up, we still keep trying to make it that you know. Yeah, you know, and I I like to just think that um, not just in this lifetime, but you know, truly since the beginning of time, we have just been practicing uh, our own misunderstanding. <laughs> <laughs> yes. We've been practicing our misconceptions. We've been practicing our fear, our anxiety, our ignorance, our greed, our anger. We've been practicing it. So and we've gotten very good at it. We're very good at it. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. You you talk about uh about uh ideals as being difficulties. Yeah, they are. Yeah, why don't, why don't you expand on that a little bit? Yeah, first? well, that's because we we think it's wherever we think we know what's right or what's best or what um, and you know and, and even here, let me take this out of the abstract. You know, we were talking earlier about relationships. Well, you know, there's this whole notion that there's somebody who's the right person for you, right? And that there's an ideal relationship or that there's an ideal marriage, soulmate, an ideal job, and. You know, and of course, this is, this is useful. It's useful and practical for us to think like this at a certain part in our life. You know, as we kind of transition from the marvel and wonder, and you know, the the uh, you know, nobody would insist that a child somehow, you know, have a life plan. <laughs> Not a five-year plan, a ten-year or a life no, plan. No, but then we make this transition to somehow we're supposed to take our life and manage it, you know, become the uh, captain of the ship, you right. know, the master of our fate, and it's supposed to go a certain way. And then we take those ideals, which they become very dangerous because nothing matches or meets the ideal or sustains it, and then we judge by that standard. Well, I would have the ideal this if only that, you know. And that's when it gets back to the point that real transformation occurs when something in life 
is not at all the way you want it, not at all the way you like it. Our instinct at this point, our habit may be to dispose of it, but what that is really showing you is that there's a fundamental error in the way in which we view things. We judge them to be right or wrong, good or bad, on the basis of our own limited view. Absolutely. And that puts us at arm's length from our life. Life becomes like something that is is being thrust at us against our will. (laughs) Well, well, you know, there's a pretty famous physicist back in the 50s who said that, you know, in the whole universe or universes, there were only two things, and that was points to view and points of view. Mm. And it really, you know, everything is created from those two things. I, I know in my world, point of view is everything. Point of view is you. Yeah, it's, yes. it's everything. You know, isn't it interesting that sometimes we think that we can overcome disagreements and conflicts through a process that we've gotten very, very sophisticated about these processes. Essentially, they amount to a process where I can convince you, George, to have my point of view. Absolutely. Or either pretend. And it, and it will be so much better for you if you do. <laughs> Yeah. Well, I know that, you know, like in my in my own world, I, I, geez, I'll tell you what, every I had to come by much of what I have, what I have learned that is really useful via pain. Yeah, uh, that's a tremendous teacher. Oh, yeah, we all do. Oh, boy. I, and there's nothing quite like a broken heart. A uh, broken heart is really good for transformation and for losing weight. <laughs> maybe, it sure is. Yeah, yeah, maybe one of the best ways to lose. But, but in that pain... Boy, some of the best gifts I have been, I have found or been given have shown up in my life, in my sure. world. Sure, yeah. Well, you know, that, that opening of a broken heart, you know, it's really a spiritual opening. Right. Um, it just comes in the form, it looks like, oh my gosh, another relationship gone bad. But a broken heart can be, you know, anything. Life is one long broken heart. Oh, it sure. You know? yeah. There's a bitter sweetness to it, and that's the fundamental fact of life is that it's impermanent. So we're always saying goodbye. And, you know, how we manage that is when when we don't really wake up to that fact and look into it deeper, then we actually always see our loss, you know, and we dwell in grief. But the truth is, if you really open your eyes, all you see is transformation occurring in front of you. And I'm literally talking about, you mean, we might call it nature. Right. But the truth is it's you and your life. It's the way the sun transits the sky and the way the days pass and the way the seasons flow one into the other and the way the years accumulate and our bodies change, you know, and our personalities mature, our children grow up. That's really just one long broken heart. <laughs> it's a long broken heart. And, 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 you know, and I think the familiarity of life, <coughs> excuse me, I've been trying to come down with a cold here. <coughs> The familiarity of life really kind of pulls us out of the wonder and the mystery and the fantastic uh, things that, are, you know, like are around us that are miraculous that we, yeah. you know. Well, you know, there's that old saying, familiarity breeds contempt. Yeah. And essentially what it is, we, we think we, we understand it because we've experienced it right. before, you know, and we think it's some place. Been there, done that. Right. That saying that was popular. As though um, it's nothing new. But the truth is that every moment is new, and every moment is fresh, and change is, is constant. And that's, there's marvel and mystery in that. How does that happen? Well, what's interesting is we'll pay big money to go to a, a movie that surprises us, but when life does, we complain. It, yeah. <laughs> you know, so. Yeah, exactly. Well, that's that difference between, you know, how we categorize our experiences so we can keep them safe. Right. You see, and, and in, we, we want to be insulated from the reality of our own life. And, and in truth, that contrived experience in a movie theater or even in a book is, can be a way to insulate us from the reality of our own life, which is frankly more than most of us can bear. You, you think underlying all of that is uh, fear? Yes. Especially fear of death? Yeah, yes, absolutely. Absolutely. I mean, we, we um, I'll tell you that something that my teacher tells me all the time. The basic ground of ego is fear. Right. So, so wherever we're coming from fear, we're coming from ego, which is that small self. And the function of ego is to defend and protect us and keep us safe. 
but it's a job that cannot be executed because it's not possible it's not possible well. exactly so in certain situations you know when the um saber tooth tiger is chasing us you know uh that ego kicks in and the adrenaline activates and we run like heck you know and that's a wonderful use of ego um and the force of ego which of course is not a bad guy but um what we have done by our habits of mind is that we have elevated this particular faculty and function of ourselves, which should be limited, you know, is no more marvelous or mysterious than the function of the pancreas, for instance. And we have made it the master of our lives. Do you think some of that comes to, you know, they talk about having the uh, primal brain portion of the brain and, the, you know, the three different areas of the brain. Do you think some of this is just, uh, you know, that we get through our DNA or, our, our you know? It's in what our, we are. And, yeah. and I just kind of want to keep going, getting back to that rather than, in my case, because I'm a spiritual practitioner. Right. And I practice Zazen. I practice Zen. Okay. I know, I realized I could not, it, whatever understanding I might arrive at, for either the functioning of the marvel of my body, the marvel of my brain, the, you know, the functioning of whatever, whatever limited intellectual understanding or grasp that I could have of that was worthless. Yeah, yeah. So what I really, the only thing that sufficed to soothe my sadness, in my grief, to console me, to give me. Um, you know, uh, joy, exhilaration was the practice itself so that I simply could experience <coughs> the one truth of my life and no longer worry about what it meant. I've been meditating for right around 30 years right now, and meditation, and when you, you know, when I, when I see your kind of meditation, I, I'm with you. I don't think there's any particular right or wrong way to meditate. But, you know, what I've come away with from just s sitting and what was available to me, um, you know, it, fr from from deep within or from somewhere, uh, the clarity, the answers yeah. that come, uh, sure. it, it's pretty amazing. Yeah, it is. And, and, you know, we all know it because, you know, we, we hear it a lot. And, um, of course, it's difficult to do because of that very thing that I mentioned earlier. We have given the ego mind, which is restless and agitated and needs movement, that the mind that gives their constant commentary and judgment, you know, that's really where we dwell. We have made that the master Absolutely. of our lives. Absolutely. And my teacher, Maizumi Roshi, used to say, you know, it's a, it's a wonderful servant, but it's a miserable master. And so the point of meditation is to put things in the proper order, you know, so that our pure being, which is really just the marvel and wonder of the breath, and our own awareness and our attention, really, that we can just experience that, it puts out all the fires. Well, you start to wonder, you know, when you first start to meditate, you start to wonder, well, who is this in here? Who am I really? What am I, yes, yes. And, and it all changes. It just all you, you know, you have, you, because you begin to realize the mind isn't me. There, there's something larger than yes. the mind, and yes. and it well, has and not and been what in that charge. What happens is that you you simply stop. The commentary slows. Right. And you're no longer self-identified with your thoughts. And um, and and your thoughts, whether you realize it or not, are judgments. Almost all of them are judgments. I like this, I don't like this. Right. I want to do this, I don't want to do that. Um, I can't wait, I hope I never, you know, just off back and forth and back and forth, going into the past to try and reconstruct that, going into the future in order to either fantasize about either a worst case scenario or a best case scenario, but nonetheless something that doesn't exist. And that's the way that we keep ourselves so completely distracted from facing the reality of our lives. And sometimes, only sometimes, is the reality difficult. Most of the time, the reality is splendid. 
the, absolutely. And well, you know, I found that that part of my mind was like kind of entertainment for me. You know, it was like oh, go, sure. oh it's go a off. Stimulus. Yeah, absolutely. And we're addicted to it. Addicted, it's a absolutely. To which we're addicted. Yeah. Plus, not only am, am I was I am I addicted to it, but I, I can also be slothful and I don't really want to take control of it and charge of it. You know, it's like sure, it, it sure. likes to just go off and do whatever it wants to do. So you, in your book, you talk about self-serving narratives. How, yes. how about expanding on that idea? Yeah. Because that well, is you know, so that is huge. The story of your life. Right. And we've constructed a story of our life, and we, um, we told it to ourselves and to many others. Many, 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 many times. Everybody who would listen. Yeah, oh, yeah. And, <laughs> and we tell it to a lot of people who right. have no interest at all. But we're always embellishing it, you know, and adorning it. And this sounds kind of cold-hearted, but the truth is that once you reach a point where you are sickened by your own story, you know, you just want to get out of it as soon as you can. And, and, you, and you start to see how immersed and enmeshed and tangled people are in their own self-serving nar- narrative. And when I say self-serving, I mean... What's interesting is sometimes what serves us is that we, we're so, it's the pain and sorrow of it. We want to relive that, you know, that awful victimhood, you know, or whatever didn't go quite right. You know, this is that old story about how, you know, the first thing to let go of is your parents, really. Oh, and for them, sure. Let them be human beings instead of yeah. parents. Um, so, yeah, that's really, sometimes what we, what we are, when, yeah, when we first sit down to meditate, or the, the start of every spiritual journey, the start of a spiritual journey, George, as you know, is self-examination. Absolutely. And so we start, and when we start examining ourselves, the first thing that we do is we look at that story, and, you know, we believe it to be true. That's who we think we are. With all our heart and all our being. Yes, and we think that, that without that basket of past experiences, we wouldn't exist. That's how attached we are to that version, that story. It's kind of where pain comes in, isn't it? It just gives us that big jolt that we got to say, okay, now i got to look at some things differently here. Yeah, and we, that's a kind of, for, for most of us, it's a kind of a constant low-level pain, maybe, that will right. no harbor resentment or recrimination or about something from the past, you know. I like to say that the, that the past is where pain resides. And the future is where fear resides. <laughs> and the best so place is right here. Between those two. Yes. Going to the past for our dose of pain, and we go into the future for our dose of fear. Never pausing at the very place where there's neither pain nor fear for most of the time. And that is right here in this present, this present moment. But, um, yeah, we are, I, I lead retreats and workshops, and I just did one this weekend, and you know, bless their hearts, everybody has a sob story. And everybody has pain. Every Everybody. Yeah. Every one of us. And so I spend a day with people in meditation and other mindfulness practices. And I really, that's really what a teacher does, is always standing outside that burning house of suffering and pain and say, step out, step out, step out. And after the end of eight hours, I'll still have people come up to me asking me if I couldn't sanction, give them a little bit more permission. Huh. Isn't it useful to probe <coughs> the past and dig deeper into my experiences in order to heal? Well, well sure, and that's that's the, the, you know, the basic format of most therapies. Yes. Is to go back there and dig around. And, yeah. You, you know, I, I, in, in the work that I've done on, on in going back in through this self-examination stuff, you know, I, I heard people say, well, you, you can't change your past, so why bother? But what, what I found was I really could change my past because mu- much of it was imagined. <laughs> so true. You, you know. Just, just stop imagining it. Just it, stop embellishing it. Yeah. Stop just, remembering it, just, and it. And the pain disappears absolutely and and a whole new vista opens up and yeah. you step into your own power but yeah. that requires you know the, the the one word that so many of us are are like not wanting and that's that we must become responsible yeah that's responsibility. yeah and that's the you know that's one of the issues when when we wake up and we're and if we're speaking to someone that's not awakened the, the deal is there's only one person can be responsible for the moment then that's whoever's awake yeah, yeah. Well, you, you're the only person who can be responsible for your own life, no matter what. Period. Right. right. And, you know, I think, in a way, that's just, um, 
we, we first talked about relationships and and how we the, uh, how we distort them and it's true in everything to which we relate whether we're talking about our how we want what we want to derive from our career what we want to derive from the people in our lives what we want to derive from a teaching you know um, and that is that inherent in this I think is kind of an implicit desire to to give someone or something else responsibility for our happiness you know we invest our happiness our power in something or someone else and that's why we stay unhappy <laughs> absolutely well you know in in talking about these self-serving narratives the real uh, not just the, the relief from all that self-serving stuff is to become uh, a servant Yes, and that's where that's where the real joy yeah. starts to happen is when sure. you when you get over yourself. Yeah, you realize you're self. here, to and that self. Now that I want to talk about, sometimes I say, well, how, you know, I'm, am I supposed to go to a nunnery? You know, am I supposed right. to go to Tibet or India or Calcutta? Or what do I have to do? But the truth is, every time you set aside your own preference, I don't want to do this right now. You are committing yourself to a life of service that is not self service. The self is saying, I don't want to do this. I don't want to make dinner. Right. I don't want to do the laundry. I don't want to move forward. You know, that's you're setting that aside. And you then your life becomes one in which you suddenly are awake to what really needs to be taken care of. And it's not your old story. <laughs> it's whatever's present. What's ever here in the moment. Yeah, whatever's in front of you. Well, you know, I, 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 the, a lot of the people I talk with are wondering, well, what should I do? What should I do? And what I've found is that if I just do what's right in front of me and do it to the best of my ability, somehow or other I find out what I'm supposed to be doing. Absolutely. It, it just that's progresses. The, that's the essence of the teaching, that your life, your life. You know, and, and oftentimes what we do, George, is we'll say the moment or the now. Right. You know, and that even... You know, that's that's a little bit tricky because suddenly we think that living in the moment is a certain kind of moment. Or living in the now is kind of a now that's different than my life. That's, no, living in your life, which is what my teacher always said, your life is your practice. So it's your life. So your life, wherever it is, as it is, is unfolding in a way that has something for you, bringing your attention to it. And and taking care of it, whatever, it is. <coughs> however ordinary or mundane, however menial you might judge it to be, however routine it is, is the meaning and purpose of your life, well, and it will always lead you someplace else. Uh, well, yeah, absolutely. As a matter of fact, wherever my eyes are looking, the rest of me is following. So <laughs> you know, right. wherever I'm putting and, my. You know, and, and it's a it's a it's a um, you know it's a never ending path. So essentially what I'm meaning is, you know, you can say, well, you mean all that you have to do is, you know, do your laundry, or all you have to do is clean the bathtub, or all you have to do, isn't that just, you know, beneath you? And the truth is that one thing always leads to the next. And, you know, life is always changing, and, and opportunities are always arising, and, you know, uh, it's, it's uh, you open to that and you realize, oh my gosh, this is the journey. Well, yeah, and after you've been around a while, around this life a while, and you end up someplace and you think, uh, God, this, this is nowhere where I had planned or what I, <laughs> you know, what happened here. <clears throat> you, another thing you talked about in your book that I found very interesting, and I, I've just, I've seen this in so many people, and maybe you can talk to a bit about insufficiency can be our most cherished possession. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. That's that feeling that, that we're not enough or not good enough. We don't have enough. We don't know enough, um, you know, that we're just, and it's a negative, self-critical belief system. And you know what's so interesting is even those of us who might claim that we don't have a belief system, well, we do well, have we, a belief system. Yeah, we, we do. Yeah. And, and usually it's that one. And if you really start, you know, this isn't something that, you know, I, I found out by studying uh, a course. Right. If you sit down on a cushion <laughs> and you sit with your own monkey mind and you watch your thoughts, 
your thoughts, for the most part, are negative. Almost all of them. Yeah, about you, your life, your circumstance, and how it is inadequate. And 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 the truth is that there is an, a whole industrial complex of specialists and gurus and self-help formulas and devices that feed into that, that say, yes, you're right, you're not good enough, but here's ten ways, here's three steps, here's it's, a new you can you change know, that. kind of a management system, here's a new <coughs> method that you can use in order to uh, manufacture the life that you really deserve. And inherent in that is the implicit belief that your life is inadequate. Has to be, otherwise there's no need for any of that other. Yeah. It's just, it's just, yeah, it's all part of that deal. Yeah. Well, well, isn't there, there, you know, there's, there's a certain amount of power that we, th- that we feel that we derive from placing ourselves in this victim stance. You know, it's a, it becomes kind of a way to control those people around us when we feel we don't have any control. Maybe so. Yeah, I, 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 I'm, I'm sure that's true. It's, um, well, you know. Yeah, I've found that that you know, like. This this self serving stuff. I mean, it goes. It's really powerful. It goes really deep. We don't really, you know. I I I I do a lot of service kind of things. But and when I look at it, you know, at first I I wanted to think that I was, uh, um, you know, I was just being a good guy. But the truth was, the truth is, I'm still serving myself because I get joy from being sure. the servant. So sure, sure, sure. Yeah, and 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 that's. That's really the secret to genuine fulfillment. Oh, absolutely. And that's that's how it comes. Yeah. Yeah. It, there's there's nothing more rewarding than um, than than serving others. Well, well, you know, and that's the joy of being a teacher. And I'm not talking about you know having to be a guru. I'm talking about really being a teacher. Um, there's something goes with that you can't get any other way. You can you can be a multimillionaire from from your lectures or your workshops or whatever you're doing. But but a real teacher, there's it's it's a whole different ballgame. Yeah, and you know it can happen in the in, in just the simplest ways. What we're talking about here is love, um, and we might call it kindness, right? Or maybe we call it breakfast, you know, or maybe we call it saying hello, you know, or or maybe we call it giving a handshake. But there is this transmission of love, uh, attention that we are all capable of extending outward. And that's what transforms the world. And it, it, it is so simple. We all want more kindness, and we want more love and kindness, and we want more love in our lives and joy. But as long as we're back in our skulls, trying to manufacture it out of, you know, contriving a different story with it maybe a different ending to the story, if we would just open our eyes, and actually occupy the lives that we have with that power, that power that we can always share, a smile, a hello, you know, a greeting, a, a gift, a token, a look even. You know, what I find is interesting is that we now, you know, about the only thing we really look into consistently is maybe a smartphone. <laughs> uh, and we spend a lot of time there, don't we? Yeah, that I, mean, between... I don't have a smartphone, so I don't. But I mean, and that alters everything because you see, even the head looking down, and 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 no longer seeing the environment, the world, no longer really seeing your own life. Instead, relating only through the pulses of light that come through a screen. It's really a, a powerful and kind of dangerous turn of events, I think. Well. <coughs> <clears throat> oh, excuse me. <clears throat> Don't you think that's kind of a of a two edged sword? In that it can be what you just described, but but it, it, I think it depends on who's in charge, whether the screen's in charge or whether you're. <laughs> well, yeah, like all things, you know, and 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 Buddhism is called the middle way. Oh, right. You know, that, right. That it's not either or, like all good or all bad. That that is this middle ground between complete laxity on one side and prohibition on the other, you know, neither one of those. Yeah, but we have to be awake, really highly conscious and alert in order to moderate that for ourselves. And and willing. practice helps even with that, to be able to discipline 
how much of our lives we are, uh, you know, spending in the things that, that not, single, not one single person would say that television is the most important thing in their life. And yet they may spend more out time watching television than, than anything else. Than anything else. Yeah. Yeah. So you were talking about the, the good and the bad, and which brought to mind another statement that you made in your book that, that's like very, very powerful. And that is when we release ourselves from judgment and inadequacy, we free everyone else from criticism and blame. Yeah. That's very, very powerful. Yeah, we do. If, because when we are critical with ourselves, if all we're ever doing is holding ourselves up to a standard and finding ourselves to be lacking, I promise you, since there's just one world, <laughs> that's what we're doing with everything in it. Everything. Everything in it yeah. is not good enough, not quite right, not this, not that, not that. Yeah, exactly. And as a as a parent, I began to see that not only in, in my own parenting and in the parents around me. And I knew where there were parents who were just so tortured by their own uh, critical view of themselves as parents that that their they were looking at their children as being the inadequate result. That was what your first book was basically about, was it not? Yeah, it was about early parenting. Right. Because that, it was in that experience, George, that I realized, you know, up until then I had um, thought that my spiritual life and my spiritual training was a facet of my life that occurred outside of my everyday life. Right. Maybe it was going to be in conflict and, oh my gosh, when I became a mother, what's going to happen to my spiritual life now? I'm going to put it on the back burner. And then I realized in, the, in, in really the warp and wolf, the, the reality of, of, of parenting that that was a spiritual practice. <coughs> and that's where my meditation and all my training had to be brought to bear, was in that moment with, you know, which is, there's a lot of difficult moments in parenting. Oh boy, <laughs> yeah. Yeah, a lot of, uh, there's a lot of joy, but there's also a lot of heartbreak. Sure, because most of the time, it's not going the way you want it to. <laughs> oh, ab ab absolutely. And that's where most suffering comes, doesn't it? It's like... Sure, it's that, not, oh my gosh, you know, that, that, that relinquishment, you know. If they would only do this, everything would be wonderful. Yeah, and know. we're so particularly with our children, I think we see, and it's brought up really right up to the skin on our nose, how much of our lives we're uh, judging what's happening right now on the basis of some perceived eventual outcome, you know. Yeah. Oh, I can't let my child do this because they're going to turn into that. You know, I, I don't think this is appropriate because it's not going to lead to, to the place I want my child to end up. You know, that is really where the, oh my gosh, that's a gulf that no one can navigate. But with our children, since we think that's really what our job is, is to be a good parent, is to somehow deliver the best possible outcome. Absolutely. Yeah. Uh, for, for judgment's sake. Yeah. Well, and, and then we start to see, oh, my gosh, maybe I'm living my whole life. And so it's an outcome. Right. Yeah. You, you know, back to this idea of uh, self-examination and self-inquiry. You, you talk about uh, psychological reflections, and, and I think you say that too much conceals more than it reveals. Yeah. I, I, I found that to be true in therapy. What, can you expand a little bit on, on what you mean by well, that? Well, I think it's just we, we've gotten very good. We're all very <coughs> versant in the language of the psychotherapeutic model. Absolutely. Yeah, which is a set of, you know, we then derive this self-image, this narrative that says, well, this is what I'm like. I'm, I'm an adult child of an alcoholic, and I have abandonment issues, and I am relationship phobic, and I'm wh whatever it is. We've gotten very good at that. It's just a set of names and labels and limitations, actually, that aren't real. Um, you know, it's another way. It, it comes in a medical model, so it sounds like it has, rea it, that it's really validated. Right. That that is, and, it's a, and we use it in a limited sense. In other words, we use it to say, well, I can't do that because this is who I am. Right. And I'll never be able to be like this because of who my parents were. Or whatever it is, we use it in that way. And then, of course, we have concealed the potentiality of ourselves, you know, the vast, limitless possibilities in life. 
Well, that takes us back to this whole idea of, of uh, giving up our story. Yeah. And and all the things that we believe that just are, you know. I, I'll i tell you, I'll, I'll share one of uh, that I had. My father died when I was six, and I didn't hear anything about my grandfather, so I just assumed he must have died before he was 30. So both of them had died before they were 30. And I decided that I, I was going to die before I was 30. Oh, yeah. And I made life decisions based on that idea. Yeah. And I was like, I think, 42 or 43 one day. I thought, well, gee, that isn't going to happen. <laughs> <laughs> and I yeah, took, but in the meantime, you set, in cor- you set the course. And set yeah. The These things that had karmic consequences. Oh, yeah, huge yes, consequences. Absolutely. And uh, that comes both from your thoughts, your words, and your deeds. So... In the meantime, and it was all based on a lie. Oh, it was just, it was an illusion, a total, <laughs> total yeah. fantasy. You know, and I often find sometimes we, 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 science, I'd say, and maybe even medical science really is a religion, you know? Uh, it sure for, is, for yeah. For culture. Yep. And I find that it's also just, it's almost, well, I, it sounds like, it, once again, if I say if it's laughable, but it's, so upsetting and disturbing to me when I see that somehow now what people do, they've changed that story. It's still a limited story, but it's about DNA right? and genetics, always in the sense of a limitation. Well, I have a bad memory because my father had a bad memory.